have a good lunch? Everybody got that whole like pizza coma thing going on? Or did we amp up on the Mountain Dew and the Diet Coke and all that other stuff too? Is that all good? A little of both? So, so, you got the, so we got the big jitters going on then. We're like, you know, too much food and then, and then we got the Mountain Dew and the Diet Coke and all that stuff going too, so cool. Thanks everybody for showing up. Um, the talk is called uh, Shopping for Nerds, and I'm going to probably talk for a little bit and kind of set a framework a little bit of kind of, I've had a lot of people recently kind of ask me for advice. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a business co-founder or a business founder, and I need to get my ideas done. Okay, now do I need to find a co-founder? Do I need to uh, hire an outsourcing team? Or do I need to uh, hire a freelancer or an employee? Or what do I do next, right? Uh, and, uh, and so I thought I'd just kind of roll that into a little bit of a, kind of a framework for thinking about it. Um, but I'm hoping that there's also going to be a lot of, you know, interaction here. So ask questions, interrupt me, whatever you want to do. Um, my background, my name is Neil Tovson. Uh, launching a startup called Approve. Um, it's uh, uh, basically a mechanism for me to spend your money safely, uh, really for small, small businesses, teams, freelancers, contractors, that sort of thing. Um, but why are we here? Well, the reason we're here is because this is uh, the graph of how likely you are to fail if you're starting a startup. So if you've done one, you have a 12% chance of succeeding. If you've done three startups, you have roughly a 30% chance of succeeding. So even after you're a so-called veteran, you still have a 70% uh, chance of failure at your startups. There are too many ways for startups to die to end up letting the simple things, or at least the things that seem like they should be simple, be the reasons for your death. You know, you should, if, if you're starting a startup, my goal is if Approve's going to die, I want Approve to die because we didn't hit our target market or because the consumers didn't uh, accept what we were trying to provide. I don't want Approve to die because we hired an offshore team and paid them a bunch of money and then they never gave us code. So along those lines, <laughs> you know, what are some of the stories, right? Of course, some of you have probably heard some of these sorts of stories. Um, I'm going to anonymize them to protect the innocent. Um, but uh, I talked to somebody recently who spent $100,000 for a firm to produce a plan. So basically a PDF, $100,000, and he had still was zero closer to going to market. And don't you think that, you know, gosh, as a business founder, you ought to kind of know what your business plan is, right? So when you do the math on that, don't forget that every 10th page in this PDF was an advertisement for the firm hoping to actually get the work to build it after they charged him $100,000 for the 100-page PDF. Um, another one that I've heard recently several times is, uh, you know, a company doing really, really well, perhaps multiple years funding, millions of dollars behind it, and the, um, the CTO or one of the top tech people leaves under bad circumstances, and only then do they find out that well, we don't have the password for the Amazon account where all of our servers are hosted or we don't have access to the GitHub account where all the source code is. Uh, and all of a sudden, we're in a position where if the servers go down tomorrow, we can't do anything about it. And we've got, you know, tens of thousands of users on the system. Um, does anybody else have any other good stories? Go ahead, Caden. So, so $30 million and don't have a plan, yeah. And I talked to another person recently uh, out of uh, Vancouver who, uh, you know, hired a contractor to build him a whole bunch of stuff. The product hit the market and then um, that relationship went sour and he had a heck of a time trying to get the code that was on the market already. This was a hardware product too. Um, and uh, so there's all sorts of stories out there. 
So what can we do about it? What's the answer to all this stuff? And of course, we started out with the other question of, you know, should I hire, should I get a co-founder? Should I hire a firm or whatever? And that's the, kind of the reason I titled the thing that the Tao of nerds or the, the Tao of hiring or finding the right technical talent. Because the idea is that uh, Taoism is, you know, kind of the way. And it fundamentally, there's a fundamental belief in the Taoist philosophy that there is no single answer, that, there, that you can't codify the answer in a single statement um, because it all depends on so many other things. So you're a business founder. You've got this great idea, OK? But now what? So what do I do? So you've got basically six choices. You can outsource it, either onshore or offshore, hire a bunch of you know, coders uh, at, at some place. Um, you can hire freelancers. You can hire, uh, you know, rock star ninja individual contributors that, uh, that can do some awesome work. You can hire a firm, which they'll just take the whole darn thing. They'll project manage it for you. They'll help. You just basically show up for the status updates and they deliver you a product on a silver platter. Uh, you can hire an employee. You can find a co-founder, a tech co-founder, or you can do it yourself. Uh, it's kind of interesting. I've actually met uh, three business people in the last few months here that are online taking courses of how to code. You know, on one hand, they at least want to educate themselves. On the other hand, uh, one of the guy's opinions was, um, you know, I've got all these ideas spewing out of my head, and I can't afford to even test them. So I'm going to learn me some code, and I can hopefully at least kind of get a prototype together that I can test and see if there's some val validity to the idea without having to spend money to have somebody else build it. So the answer to all this really comes down to what you want to define a startup as. So a startup is an organization formed to search for a repeatable and scalable business model. That's Steve Blank, um, uh, 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 Four Steps to the Epiphany, I believe, is the book. Really, really fantastic book on startups. Um, kind of a lot of his ideas got formulated into Eric Ries's Lean Startup te uh, Techniques. Um, and then uh, one of my favorite all-time quotes, and I have no idea where it started, but anything's possible with the proper application of time, heat, money, and chemicals. Meaning you can do it any way you want as long as you know, the end result comes out. Um, I added swear words onto the end of that <laughs> as well. Uh-huh. No, it was not me. Uh, so uh, I, they told me that I had to have a slide involving Apple. Uh, so this is my obliga obligatory Apple slide, or at least it seems to be fashionable today. Uh, so Steve Jobs and, and Steve Wozniak. Um, but this, you know, one option is to go, and, and a lot of people believe that if you're doing something called a tech startup, that you need a tech co-founder. And Paul Prince, who's got a session in a little while, has some strong feelings on it, as you can tell. And I think this makes a lot of sense. You know, if you've got all non-technical people trying to lead a tech startup, it's like going to Mexico and not knowing the language, moving to Mexico and living there without knowing the language. Yes, it's theoretically possible, but there's quite a learning curve there. And again, go back to that question of, you know, there's so many ways for a startup to die. How do you improve your chances? Well, you're not helping them if you're a tech startup and you don't have tech people on staff. So I sort of believe in a lot of cases with Paul's statement, but not entirely. Because I think it all comes back to what do you want to be when you grow up, right? What kind of company are you? What kind of tech company are you? And where does the technology fit into that? What do you define as a tech company? And I think it comes down to these sorts of items. You've got com incentive, complexity, criticality, cash, and skill. So incentive is. What incentive, so if I decide to offshore my technology, what incentive do they have to make sure that it's the best possible technology that I can need for my purposes? And if the answer isn't necessarily that it has to be the best technology, then maybe outsourcing is OK, right? But the other one is complexity. If I've got a really complex business model that my technology involves a lot of moving parts, that's another sliding scale that you need to consider. Criticality. How critical is the intellectual property? Is the code itself in what you do? 
Or is your secret sauce in the distribution model, the sales model, something else, and the technology is a supporting role? Um, obviously, cash is a big piece of it. If you've got cash to hire a big gun uh, freelancer at $120 an hour, that's a whole different story than if you don't, regardless of the other things. And then, of course, skill. And not just your skill, but also the skills of the people that you're working with, because those have to mesh as well. If I'm hiring a tech co-founder, I'm going to find one with the skills to basically run the show, right? But if I'm gonna do a offshore team in Minsk or China or India, the reality is, is most of those teams, I need enough technical skill to be able to evaluate their work products. Otherwise, I don't know if what they're building is actually meeting my needs or not. So you've got these pieces of it, and then you basically compare and con contrast across these. Did I miss the, uh, I think I missed a slide in here somewhere. Oh, but this goes back to the earlier one where we listed out the six different options. So these are all different options, and you can take any path along these to help figure out what the right answer for you is. Um, but there's really one principle that drives the whole thing, right? Who's standing guard? At the end of the day, when you're live with your new product and you've got customers who are starting to use it, do you have a system in place that can make sure that the snakes don't come and eat all of your children, <laughs> right? So if you are not technically savvy enough to ensure that your absolutely secret sauce critical code is developed in the best way possible for your business model and to scale with the customers that you bring on, then you don't have some, the right kind of guard. But on the flip side, if you're a company that simply has a website and you know, maybe your digital presence is an important part of your business model, but the, the actual secret sauce of your business isn't in the code, then maybe you don't really need to worry so much about it. Or, Perhaps you're an e-commerce company who does a lot of, you know, you're selling something online, in which case there's a whole lot of products out there that you can buy off the shelf. And maybe there's a little bit of customization you do to, to add a little secret sauce into that. But fundamentally, the technology isn't necessarily the thing that's going to make you successful or not. Yeah? Thank you. <laughs> I, 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 the guy who made the logo was really, really cool. <laughs> I, I've never met him before. So, <laughs> so, you know, this, this whole like standing guard thing, contrast that with an MVP, right? If, if you're just a concept mm -hmm. to market, it doesn't mean you don't You might not be sure. Right. So that's a, so. The question is, how do I take you know? How do these principles apply when all I'm trying to do is build a minimum viable product, a prototype, something like that that I can test to see if there's some people who will adopt it? And the answer is really simple. It depends. Fundamentally speaking, what is it that you need to accomplish with that MVP? If you can build something very simple, and you are willing to then throw that away if it is success, even if it is successful, then it really doesn't matter what the technology is built in. And you may choose to do that. Sometimes building throwaway technology is so inexpensive that even if you do prove your, your hypothesis and you want to go forward with that model, you still decide you're gonna throw that technology away. And that's okay, that's totally okay. And maybe you outsource that because it's cheaper or faster or something like that, yeah. And that's the other side of the coin. And what he said, uh, for, for those that may not have heard, is, is that once the prototype's built, they almost never actually get thrown away. They become your app. And in fact, that's something I've heard a bit over the last year or so from a couple of people as well. So they paid a whole bunch of money for something that, uh, that you know, either they had to throw away because it, it couldn't work, or that they ended up 
uh, not being able to use it because it didn't actually scale. And this is where having the right person on guard to make those decisions is so important because an MVP is a minimum viable product. It's supposed to be fast, it's supposed to be cheap, et cetera, et cetera. But somebody has to decide. Whenever, you're, whenever uh, that coder is writing a single line of code, they are making decisions on your behalf, okay? Every line of code that they write needs to be in line with your goals. And that's why when we go back to these things over here, incentives, complexity, criticality, do they have the skills? And are they incentivized? And are they close enough to you, as in like sitting next to you every day, versus offshore, they don't know your business model, don't know you, don't know your goals, you just gave them a spec of make a screen look like this? How would you expect them to make decisions line by line through that code of how much effort to put into this because it matters versus that because it doesn't? Yeah. Neil, do you think there's, what's the degree of risk if you were to think that you could use outsourced employees to be the person standing there? I think that that is the big question. You know, what is the risk? is the whole decision. All of this is simply risk analysis. Um, but I think that you know, if you have the skills to A, articulate your vision, so, so for example, let's go through some of these. One of the things about outsourcing, for example, is that they almost, especially if you're offshoring, but even some onshoring companies, they will not think for you. you know, you have to really be very specific in what you're asking them to build. And they aren't gonna care about your business model. They aren't going to, and this is just my experience, but we're talking about, you know, I've worked with a number of offshore companies. And, and the thing is, is that they're very inexpensive and they can deliver working code, but you are fully responsible for making sure that every pixel on that screen is what you wanted. And that the code that they're writing is of an acceptable quality for what you're looking for in the future. Because the worst thing that can happen is, okay, it looks great, but then when you try and iterate on it, add features, tweak it, whatever, the code that they wrote was so sloppy that it's expensive to do that. And then you eat up all the savings that you got from the low hour hourly rates by shipping the work offshore. So if you understand, if you have the mix of the skill to overcome the skills from the offshore team, to be able to be very good in your specifications and then evaluate the result, at least have enough to understand that you know, what I asked for shouldn't have taken 80 million lines of code to write, then you can pull that off. You can use offshore, and I've done that. Yeah. Uh, sorry, uh, uh, Phil. Isn't there also another decision making process? Product on the screen. Right, and that's kind of where we went back for what do you want to be when you grow up? That was kind of the intent of that statement is, you know, am I really a tech company in the sense of the technology is all of my secret sauce? Or am I a company that uses technology, you know, but my secret sauce is in my, my distribution model or my relationships with, uh, you know, customers or something like that. Does that get at what you're talking about? Fair enough, yeah. Because I think that, that's a pretty basic answer. Answer that first, first that, that question you just said gives you the title right. Then that, and then that naturally flows into all the rest of your right. items that are spot on. Well, and I think another thing too that, that was kind of, I, I don't think I actually have a slide to address this specifically, but you're kind of getting into the sort of what technologies should we use to build what, what my really awesome idea is. And again, you come back to how much skill do you have? If you have the skill and, the, and you've educated yourself enough to answer that question for yourself, you don't need somebody else to answer it for you. But if you don't really know the difference between PHP and Ruby and Java or why I would use one versus the other, then you need somebody standing guard for you to help you answer that question. That, uh, there's a session a little bit later about recruiting from Paul to Bettings, who's in the back of the room, and he's gonna dive into that in a whole bunch of detail. How do I find the talent? How do I find, how do I find that resource? 
Yeah, Ralph. Oh, I'm sorry, Caitlin, you've been waiting. All right. And I also want to mention one recent uh, conversation I had. Somebody spent hundred thousand, hundred and ten thousand dollars hiring a developer with an iPad and iPhone app. They put it on the uh, App Store, and they generated six thousand five hundred dollars in revenue out of that. And uh, six months later, uh, they are getting so many negative comments that there are no updates. They have already spent hundred and ten thousand dollars on this app. This person does not have any resources. Right. So, so I, I have so many people come to my meetup group and ask me, like, I want to build this cool app and I think we can make a million dollars out of it. Ask them, do you know how to code? <laughs> Don't do that otherwise. Ideas are like opinions. Right. And opinions are like some other human body part that we all have. <laughs> right? Everybody's got them. <laughs> right? So, I mean, an idea unexecuted is just an idea. So the execution of it, that's really what we're getting at here. Um, and I brought this slide up, I kind of threw that on there as a bonus, and I'm probably going to get hung by any other fellow tech people like myself that are actually looking at this, but when you're like trying to find that person, especially if you're going to hire somebody, you're going to hire a freelancer, or you're going to get a co-founder, I mean, you kind of need to look for these sort of nerd psychological disorders, which of course none of them I have, of course. Uh, but you've got the, um, you've got the, uh, the not invented here syndrome, right? If I didn't build it, it's crap. So even if you spent a hundred grand on something before, uh, when I take over it, we're going to start over. Okay. Right. Um, and then we have the shiny hammer syndrome, which is I don't really, you know, care, you know, what anybody else in the world knows. There's this really new, lang cool new language out there that I gotta use, and we gotta use that on your app. And you know what? Uh, later on, you might find out that you can't actually hire a. a, a you know, add to the team or replace me because nobody else knows that language um, and it never adopted and there's no tools to support it and et cetera, right? So then you've got the, um, let's see here, my notes aren't showing up on my lap. Oh, now they're kind of showing up. Cool, so we've got the um, over-specialization syndrome, which is something you find if you hire somebody that's been in the corporate world a lot where they're used to just, I do databases. <laughs> And JavaScript is just not in my religion. So, uh, and you know, you can't deal with that in a startup. That works okay at Thomson Reuters, that works okay at Best Buy, um, but in a startup that doesn't work. Um, so we've got uh, NMJS, not my job syndrome. Another case of specialization where, you know, oh, I'm not gonna help you manage the Twitter account this week, I'm a software guy. Well, whatever. Um, the overbuild syndrome, this one actually was me uh, for a long time, uh, where you know we don't have a single customer yet. We don't have a single user. We've never actually put it in front of somebody, but I'll guarantee you that this thing will scale to 200,000 concurrent users. <laughs> and I've spent the last eight months building it to do that, even though there's one screen with one button. Um, <laughs> right. The business blindness system, or a syndrome, where the, you know, Again, it goes back to, you know, can, uh, who, somebody needs to be educated to jump the gap between the business and the technology to make sure they're in alignment. And if it works well, both the tech guy and the business guy speak enough of each other's language to, to, to figure out where that line is. Um, but if you've got, you know, and this is a big case with offshoring, they don't know your business model and they really don't care, right? But it can be the same with a tech co-founder even. If the tech co-founder is so mirror focused on, or laser focused on the technology that they really don't care what the business model is, how could they possibly build you the right technology? So, and then, uh, let's see, I think I got one more good one here. Or two more, we got, we got the just-in-time syndrome, which is kind of the, the same sort of thing, the complete inability to anticipate future needs. You don't want to overbuild stuff, it is a minimum viable product and iterate based on customer feedback and all that stuff. But I look at software a lot like the architecture of a building, okay? So think about it this way. Um, if, if you have a single family home and suddenly you decided to host minibar, 
<laughs> You've probably got the wrong structure, right? Now, on the flip side, if you have a single family home and you decided to you know, have a, a, a meetup group with 10 people, that's fine. I can move the chairs around in the room. I can move the tables around. If I really need to, I can move the, you know, the big heavy cabinets around. Uh, with some work, I could add an addition on the back. I can make it a three car garage instead of a two car garage. But if somebody comes along and says, you know, I need a 20 story skyscraper, that's just not going to work, right? So a good technology partner, again, back to that person standing guard, is going to help you figure out how big of pilings do we need here? How, wh which, which walls in this building are foldable and which ones are not, okay? Because that's what's going to help you figure out what directions you can pivot cheaply and easily versus what direction, because you can't build anything so cheaply, you know, it'd be a house of cards if, if there's no permanent walls. Um, so that typically won't serve any business needs well. There has to be something sort of foundationally there. So which pieces need to be there and which pieces don't? And somebody needs to make those decisions. Uh, and then the last one was uh, um, the, uh, is it the business blindness syndrome? Or, or I can, oh, okay. Oh, the I know it all syndrome. This is, uh, so, so another one, uh, uh, this one kind of came out of was uh, uh, two co-founders that have been working together for more than a year um, and um, the business co-founder trusted the tech co-founder so implicitly that it wasn't until nearly a year went by when that business co-founder uh, finally started demanding to see the app that they'd been building for a year. And the tech co-founder then sort of refused to show it to him. And they both had been, you know, working on this supposedly for a year uh, and, and there was nothing there. Um, but, but he just, you know, trusted, you know, tech guy knows everything, you know, and, and the tech guy said, I know everything, and I'm working on it. It'll be awesome, I promise. Um, but there was never any accountability, there was never any transparency, there was never any communication about it. Um, so we go back to, you know, how do we deal with this sort of stuff? And step number one, communication. Communication, communication, communication. Talk to each other. Share, you know, if you're the business person, share the business plan, share the finances. If you're the tech person, share the code. Talk about how the code works. Figure out how to put it in a way that the business guy understands. Business person, try and understand what the tech guy's saying so that you kind of can help figure out where the risks are as well. Um, also, access. Everybody needs access to all those things. Um, when we started Approve, I, I insisted that Michael create the GitHub account. Because at the end of the day, um, somebody needs to have that administrative access and we share that password. Um, but if I get hit by a bus tomorrow, he needs to know where that is. And he needs to have access to it. Even if he doesn't have a lick of an idea of what to do with any of that code, he still needs to be able to transition that if he needs to and take ownership of it. Frequent demos. Have your tech guy show you something. If not every day, every week, at least every two weeks. I mean, if you spent two weeks as a startup and you haven't seen anything happen, that's a problem, right? And again, accountability, and that goes both ways, right? The tech guy needs to be accountable for delivering some technical uh, uh, deliverables, demos, uh, mock-ups, whatever that is, to show some progress. And the, on the flip side, it goes the other way too. You know, you're accountable to helping the tech guy understand what's the problem we're trying to solve, you know, that what's going on on the business side as well. The more you can cross the gap, the better off you're going to be. Um, don't be a jerk or whatever. Um, you know, if you're dealing with an offshore team, pay them on time. You know, get the code back, you know, expect them to deliver and all that other stuff, but pay them on time. If you're dealing with a freelancer, pay them on time. If you're dealing with a co-founder, if you're dealing with an employee, Give, you know, equitable equity in the company. Um, you know, if you're trying to rip somebody off, what do you think is going to happen to them on the, uh, on the, uh, 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 um, the uh, where are we at here? The incentive side of things, right? But it all comes back down to managing risk, kind of what we were talking about. Uh, but educate yourself. Ed, you know, the more you learn about the technology, the better off you're going to be. 
because you're going to be able to evaluate the work products. You're going to be able to help uh, communicate what your vision is. So, and then of course, communication, again. Um, and then, again, it all comes back to risk mitigation. Because at the end of the day, whatever that relationship is, it should act a lot like a marriage, right? So in a marriage, hopefully, you know, sometimes marriages don't work out. But you really, really hope that if you've got kids and a house and all that other stuff, that even if the relationship between you and your partner doesn't work out, the kids are going to be okay. The business moves on. And so whatever that relationship needs to be, whether it's a contractor or a co-founder or outsourcing, figure out if things go wrong, how can we make sure and what can I do to help make sure that that split happens in an amicable fashion and that uh, whoever, you know, whoever is going to retain the business is able to continue the business and whoever's walking away from it isn't walking away completely empty-handed and incentivized to not give you the Amazon password, right? You know, and that's again, back to communication, openness, all that other stuff. Paying contractors on time, all of those sorts of things. You know, a lot of contractors I know are even okay with if you can't pay on time or whatever, if it, you're at least open with them about what's going to happen and don't surprise them when it's already too late and let them decide if they wanna, you know, continue working kind of uh, uh, on the promise so to speak, but be open, be transparent. It's about most of what I got here in terms of slides. Um, I don't have too much else there. Does anybody have any other questions? Any more war stories? Sure, absolutely. Make sure that... Facebook is $100 million by GBNR. Mm -hmm. Yeah, make sure that, again, back to even, even as simple as who owns the GitHub account or who has the passwords to it, um, making sure that you own your intellectual property. But also, when it comes to the patents, make sure they're assigned to the company. When it comes to that Amazon account where your servers are hosted or, or whatever, the keys to the data center, that multiple people have it in the company. And if you're working with somebody who says, no, 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 I need to be the only one who has the keys for that, that, that's a pretty big red flag, right? You know, you want to be working with a team of people that are all there to ensure the success of the business. And if that's the case, then everybody should understand that multiple people need the passwords, the admin passwords for these accounts, or need the keys of the data center, or whatever that is, right? If it, again, comes back to all this stuff, so if you've got some cash, so one of the really nice things about a co-founder is, is that you should be able to, if you find the right person, it's probably the cheapest option. If they don't work for free, it'll be pretty low because they're getting a big, on the flip side, getting a big stake in the company, right? But if you've got some cash, in fact, I know somebody right now who is basically vetting a CTO, if you will, uh, by contracting with them to start with. And it costs a little more because you're not going to give them equity for it. But there's kind of this conversation that if this goes well, maybe two, three months from now, we're going to ask you to come on board full time and you're going to take a major haircut on the salary, but we're going to give you a big chunk of the company to do it. Yeah. Um, yeah, absolutely. Um, that's, a, that's, that's a very, uh, you definitely need to have that conversation with your lawyer and so forth, but you know, I'm a big fan of everybody vesting. Uh, there's, there's a website, if you haven't heard of it, called Venture Hacks, that uh, you know, they kind of lay out a lot of these sorts of, uh, of, of uh, uh, you know, ideas and, and goals and all that stuff, but it all, it all depends, right? It all depends on your situation, where, where this all fits, 
Um, you know, have you been working this idea for months or years beforehand, or is there is there other equity partners there? That's a big issue. But yeah, I mean, vesting is is there. There's there's kind of both directions there. In fact, I was just reading a venture hacks thing where they talked about not only vesting, but also early triggers. So you know, the 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 idea that a co-founder contributes really most of their value very early. But if they're vesting on a three-year or more schedule, um, their, their equity vests on a very linear basis. Um, and on the flip side, if you get acquired or get a big investor that comes in and doesn't like you for some other reason and terminates you, if your shares don't accelerate at that point, you, know, you have no control over that. If, if you get terminated without cause uh, and uh, and, and there's no clause that says your shares vest, then you know, you're, that's a big risk. Um, but it all depends. You can't always negotiate that. Sometimes you have to decide what's worth arguing over and what's worth just let's go for it and get it done. Um, and so you, know, you don't always get the perfect situation. Uh, Let go of their kid. Yeah. Uh, in give me, give me, give me the the for instance. Oh, equity. That's a tough one, right? Yeah. So, so how do I decide how much equity to let go when I yeah. bring on a co-founder? You know, again, there's no right answer to this, but ask yourself this. Do you want to own 100% of nothing, or do you want to own 50% of something really awesome? And you know, what, what, you know, how much does that co-founder bring to the table in terms of your ability to execute and get that company rolling that you just can't do yourself? And all of a sudden, the numbers become a little less, you know, the, you know, you know if it's the, the difference between 5% and 30% or whatever, you know, yeah, it's a, it's a big chunk of the company, it's a big chunk of what you've been building, but at the same time, if you're at a stage where you've realized you can't execute without having somebody on your side, then you, know, you should be willing to, uh, to give something up for that. Right. And on the flip side, too, if you're going to bring on a co-founder and their shares are going to vest for a long time, you know, what are you doing to commit to them by the same token? You know, sometimes th there's lots of answers to that question. Some, sometimes you actually hear about people reverse vesting shares. So even though you're 100% owner of your company right now, straight and clear, free and clear, in order to demonstrate your commitment to making this successful maybe you reverse vest. Um, so, I, but there's, that's not the only answer. So, and it, and it all comes back down to trust. I mean, this, this marriage thing, you know, at the end of the day, all that matters is do you trust that person and what can you do? You know, what, what's the worst possible scenario outcome out of this? And are you okay with that? And if you are, great. If you're not okay with that worst possible scenario, well, maybe this isn't the right option. Uh, back there. So I'm, uh, I mean, there might be a question here. I'm not quite sure. But I'm more of a marketer, more of an executive guy. I have zero technical aptitude. I don't code, don't want to code, don't want to code. But how does somebody like me use an SVG? I have multiple ideas. I don't want to go. Right. I think. Yeah, I think. I think. What? Michael. Michael's got this one. Yeah. 
or both. <laughs> Usually both. <laughs>